Thank you. So we continue our exploration of object-based media now and how it can push storytelling in new directions and help to create individual and unique experiences for those all too difficult to reach audiences. Um, as we heard, we're joined by four object-based media pioneers covering all sorts of different areas of creativity and writing and news and uh, production um, who are going to talk about some real-world examples of actually what object-based media means and does and how it helps them tell stories and offers them different creative processes and directions. Um, so I'll just, uh, just in case you didn't hear, it was a little faint to start with, I'll just recap on the introductions and so you know who's sitting where. We've got Sarah Glenister over on the right-hand side. She's a writer um, looking at uh, various object-based media prototypes. So I'm, heads up, going to start with you a little bit to tell us about the writing process in a moment. Uh, we have got uh, Ian Forrester from BBC Research and Development as a fire starter producer. I'm intrigued to know what that's all about. I'm sure you'll <laughs> tell us and talk about some of the projects that you've been working on. Julius Amadume, who we heard from in the first section, is a director and writer and has actually made content with object-based media. And in the previous session, we talked a lot about news and the impact of object-based media on news. And that's where uh, Rob McKenzie, editor of BBC News Labs, is going to come in and tell us about how um, it can impact journalism. So, Sarah, I said I was going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, tell us what object-based media means for you as a writer and tell us about some of the projects you've been doing with it. Um, well, for me, um, I see it as a, a separate medium. Uh, you would write differently whether you're doing radio or TV or theatre, and um, object-based media is just another medium for me, so I treat it in a different way. Um, and so I've been working with Ian. Um, I've done, I think, three projects in the DC seven years. Um, so we've um, had a go at different things, I think, um, we started with um, an online play, a kind of 10 minute comedy, uh, where the lines would change depending on where you were in the country, what the weather was like. Um, it, we had a go at inserting radio as well, live radio into it. Um, we've, since then, we've worked on um, a podcast uh, which changes depending on where you're listening to it so if you're going by train you hear one story if you're walking you hear another story um, and then at the moment working on another podcast um, where yeah we're looking more at using kind of automated voices and uh, how does the writing process differ from a conventional linear production well I mean I think at the heart of it, when you're writing, you're always going for the same aim. You're trying to emotionally engage with an audience. Um, so it's just about using perceptive media, that, that actual tool and device, to do the same thing. So you're kind of thinking from the start, what is different about this story? Um, that is, uh, how am I going to use that tool to specifically emotionally engage? Um, so that changes a little bit uh, the way that you plot a story and uh, the way that you're thinking about affecting the audience. Um, and from then, I mean, logistically, there are obviously differences. Some of the things that we've been kind of working on together are things like, how do you format this in a script? Because you've essentially got a ton of different scripts that are branching off and doing different things. So we've been looking at kind of logistically, how do you actually get around that? Uh, you must have to think in a different way as a writer because obviously as a writer you're a storyteller and then you've traditionally, as we heard in the last session, gone through an age-old process of telling a story from start to, to finish and now you're presumably having to think about all of the different branches and avenues and different um, content that goes into that story depending on who's consuming it and then you've got to make all of that make sense whatever path they take through the, the content. So how, how does all that work in practice? Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's more work, um, as Julie was saying in the last panel, but really, at the heart of it, it's, kind of, it's similar for me. It's kind of like, like doing a few different linear stories. Um, so that same process is the same, only I'm thinking, what is it about this story? Where do I want to use the perceptive media? You might not use it right from the start. You might just have a small section of your story that you're using it. So um, perhaps, like, for instance, we were talking in the last um, panel, about um, not having people stuck in their echo chambers, then if I, if I had thought ahead of my story and thought, oh, 
with people who usually view this kind of media or usually view these kind of politics, I specifically want to give them the opposite message to have an emotional impact, then those are the kind of questions I'm asking myself. So instead of going, how can I um, do one thing that is going to affect maybe a third of the audience and two thirds that isn't really to their taste, I'm thinking about how can I hit each audience differently to tell the same story. Ian, I'm going to come to you in just a second and find out how you bring Sarah's uh, scripts to life. But uh, <laughs> if you weren't in the earlier session, I just wanted to let you know that if you want to ask any of our panelists a question, you can do that <coughs> through either the BVE app or by going to the URL that you can see on the screen, uh, glissa.it slash BVE18, dot it slash bve18 if you go to that url on your device your questions will uh, magically appear on this ipad and uh, i'll put them to the panelists um so ian tell us what a fire starter producer is and how how that kind of uh, creativity works within <laughs> bbc r d and what you've been doing with object-based media I i'll say that um i don't have a, a kind of traditional research background so i'm actually a designer um, and I think I take some of the ideas about experience design and mix that with research, and that's what I think a fire starter is. Um, but I think a lot of the stuff that we do with Sarah and we've done with, with Julius and with others, um, it's very much about, it all hinges on what storytelling really is about. It's about, um, actually, uh, Marion talks about it, it's about the kind of campfire start, uh, campfire um, kind of storytelling. It's about if I'm telling the story, I'm looking at the people's faces and I'm deciding you know, how intense I want it to be, how deep I want it to be. And all we're doing is we're using technology to take advantage of the fact that you could do that now. Um, so we're using data um, to then change the story and change the impact of the story. But we're not changing all the story. This is not about kind of branching into, into affinity. This is still, you know, as storytellers, you still have a story in mind, but you want to change the story slightly depending on who the person is. So if you're telling a story to a child, you know, you're not gonna tell the same story with all the, the kind of the guts and the violence. You're gonna change the story, but the story may still be applicable, but you just tell it slightly differently. So I think that's what we're doing with technology. So just take us through maybe the mechanics, the practical steps of one of your recent projects, how you work with Sarah, how you turn that into content, and how that blended with the technology to actually deliver it out to the audience in this way. So we've, we've made a choice in, um, in the BBC, and the BBC R&D, um, as we're doing this as research, is to do this uh, with a medium that is, is quite easy and flexible. So we're using the web. So a lot of the work we've done, so for example, with uh, what Sarah was talking about, um, a drama called Breaking Out. Um, what we did is we got, uh, we got Sarah to, to write a script, and then we worked uh, tightly together, so story, story writer and developers, to actually work it out and, um, and to make it, bring it to life um, in the medium of the web. Um, so we're using mainly, if you know about it is technology like JavaScript, HTML5, we're not using proprietary technology. And I think this is some of the stuff that um, Marion was touching on before, is that a lot of the stuff you saw a long time ago, but it was very proprietary. Now we're just using the web. Now we're just using the power of the web. And that means that we can then um, show our prototypes to, to a much bigger audience. And also that has a mechanism to deal with data, and especially when it comes to, to data ethics as well. So. So Julius, you, you shared with us earlier some of your enthusiasm for this new way of telling stories. Uh, again, take us through perhaps the mechanics of how you've brought that to life. Just a second, we're not hearing you. Hello? Oh, yeah. That's better. <laughs> yeah, so when I worked with Ian, um, we looked at three particular genres. We looked at um, sci-fi, we looked at romance, and we looked at horror. So basically, I came up with a script which could work across all three genres, where the dialogue wouldn't change, 
but um, would then embrace the mechanics of each individual genre. And I also came up with a script which could also work from a, a male point of view as well as a female point of view. So there was a lot more thought process behind the, the whole thing. And um, we just kind of simplified it down as much as possible so we could actually shoot something. I was going to say, how does that translate into the practicalities of it? Because normally you write a script that turns into a shooting script. You go out and you know, scope out uh, locations, you, you shoot it, it goes into post-production. The actual production process is very linear as well. Yes, yeah. How, how do you translate a linear production process into this non-linear way of telling stories? Well, what, what, what I did was I built into the shooting schedule the different options which I needed to tell the specific mechanics of each story. And I was just well aware of which protagonist I was with at each particular time and what I needed to branch off for each one of those stories. And I tried to simplify it in such a way where there would be sort of minimal changes within the story, but it would still have a, a, the desired emotional response, which was my goal. Does your approach to that, how that story is going to evolve and uh, be told in the different branches, does that stay fixed or does that evolve through the process as you start to shoot and you start to get new ideas? It, it's, it, stay, it stays fixed um, to a certain degree because you have to still kind of control the madness, so to speak. And at the end of the day, you might have more options at the end of the day, but I'm still in control of telling each individual story and how it all branches off. So that, I guess, all three of you are perhaps more focused on scripted content. Um, Rob, you've been looking at, I suppose, the exact opposite of that, which is news. And the challenge there, I suppose, is how do you allow the audience to be in control of what type of content they're consuming and their path through that content and yet ensure that the, the BBC's uh, impartiality and uh, news agenda is maintained. If the audience is just picking what they want to see, it becomes harder for you to ensure that you're giving them an, a, you know, both sides of the story. The audience may choose only to watch one angle of that story. Uh, absolutely, and that is one of the biggest challenges uh, and one of the reasons why we've kept some of our experiments um, sort of internal for the moment rather than external while we play with some of the video and audio um, formats with this. Uh, we have released uh, one thing to the public. You can look at Newsbeat Explains that we did with our colleagues on uh, Radio 1's Newsbeat program uh, where we looked at what we called atomized news. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you can get a, a, a sort of proper BBC balanced view of the story by reading down the spine of it. And then if you're interested in any particular aspect of it, you can then expand that section and, and find out more in there, which allows people to, to create their own story to a certain extent, but within the limits of, of BBC balance and impartiality. Uh, but it is, it's a really, really big problem um, with news. Uh, and the other massive problem is you want to keep that emotional engagement. Uh, you want people to care about the news that they're, that they're reading, not for it all just to become a bunch of objects that the BBC has strung together. But equally, you don't want to be telling an artificial story because we are the news, we are not drama. How does uh, object-based news differ from just going to the regular BBC News website where I can already pretty much pick what stories I want to watch, uh, you know, on the BBC News app on my phone now, it already tailors the stories to areas that I'm interested in. So what's different with this approach? So with object-based, what, what we're looking at is how you can then break down the individual elements within a story. Uh, so are there particular bits of the story that stand on their own? Um, so a particular issue is with a lot of running news stories, you'll find that uh, you have to repeat a fair amount of what you said in your last report for the benefit of people who didn't read or watch or listen to it. So rather than make that fresh every time, which you know, costs money and ties up journalists' effort doing something that isn't particularly creative or require them to display particularly brilliant journalistic skills, could you put a lot of effort into coming up with a really, really good explanation of... I don't know, how the Syrian civil war started, to pick a really difficult example. Um, you know, and, and, and could that be you yeah. know, what we think is the absolute best explanation of that? And that's then an object that's available to be used in any BBC story looking at that. Uh, and then you can then build up different, you know, is, there, is there a particularly good quote? 
Um, you know, is uh, Theresa May saying something particularly definitive about Brexit, for example? You know, is that something that's an object in and of itself, which you then put with other objects to make a balanced and impartial news story? We'll come back to news. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, just to just want to clarify one thing, because I know you were asking more about how practically is this done. I think I didn't really answer that question properly. And uh, practically, when you shoot um, footage and you think about those shots, um, then what you do is you break that down into an object. And an object really is a piece of media with metadata. So when you look at a, at a shot, you can, as a director, as a writer, you know that that shot involves this character um, is trying to get across this, this meaning. But because you have the metadata tied to the, to, the, um, to the media, as we call it, object, then that allows you to systematically do more than just, here's a piece of footage. And if you deliver all those objects to the, to the client, then, or to the, 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 the customer, or, sorry, or the uh, audience, then you can do a lot more. You can rearrange shots. You can shorten. You can do all types of things. So practically, that's how we go from script to, to actual object base. And, and, and sorry, just, just for news in particular, one of the massive problems, well, you know, massive opportunities the BBC has is uh, you know, we make content in 40 different languages uh, for people around the world. Uh, there's a huge amount of reversioning. There's also a huge amount of difference in how people are consuming that. You might have an American audience watching on a massive flat screen TV in 4K, um, and you're also trying to reach an audience on very dodgy mobile signals somewhere in rural India. So object-based has a fantastic is a fantastic potential for news in terms of serving up our content efficiently to lots of different audiences in the way that works for them. Uh, and Ian, I was going to say the way you described that, and I think that really helps us understand, it's, it sounds a little bit like a Lego brick analogy. You, you kind of have your Lego set <laughs> kit. I, I can build the kit based on the instructions, if I like, which may be how the director or the writer originally envisaged it. But if I want, I can rearrange it however I like. Is yeah, that, so is you, that too simplistic? Or no, no. I, so I, I know that certain people don't really like the Lego analogy, but I, think I also kind of use that because it, it makes sense. But rather than here's the whole kit um, and you can mess with it, there may be a, you know, certain cases that you provide that. But in these cases, um, the director is kind of directing and saying, this is where it's going to be. But there is the ability to, to maybe go into more depth. Or because you've only got five minutes, then it's a shorter thing, but the arc is still there. Yeah, so it's, it's about those, the, the objects allow you the flexibility to do so much more, and that can be done on the production end. Um, and we're doing a lot of research into that, but also some of the stuff that we're doing, um, with, especially with, with these guys, is on the client side, you know, the actual the, the end, the end experience. I've got a great question that's come in through the Glissa app, and we've still got uh, 10 minutes or so, so time to ask a question if you'd like. Um, and I think, Sarah, I'm going to pick on you initially for this because it's a, a little bit of a question about how the stories are created. And, and the question is, may it become easier to create stories with object-based storytelling when instead of creating one story that fits all, it, it's a case of creating several stories that fit a particular viewer? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch all of that the noise in the background. So, so the question is, um, would it become easier to create stories with object-based storytelling when the tellers don't need to create one story that fits all, but rather creating several stories fitting the single viewer? Will it be easier? Is that the... Will it be easier? It sounds harder to me. But... Yes. Um, I think, well, on a practical level, yeah, there is more challenge to it. But I suppose, I mean, from my point of view, I'm always thinking, about what, what can we do to make the emotional impact the highest? And sometimes that will be... Uh, using an object-based approach. I mean, there may be things, for instance, we've kind of talked about gamifying, we've talked about personalization. There's also things like, what if you wanted to set a story on a particular street in London? It's a true story. And the only way that that person can hear that story is to walk the same steps as the character. So that gives me a whole other um, emotional tool to be working with. 
Um, so it doesn't even necessarily need to be all of this branching and seven stories. It could simply be that the story is triggered by you walking in the right place. So there are lots and lots of different ways to use it. And I think for the storytellers, it's really about using it in a way that is economical to get the most emotional impact rather than just putting it on top. So there's all sorts of other tools that, and, and if we look around BV, there's plenty of uh, uh, booths with, with examples of these tools that we can use to enhance our creative and technical and craft and storytelling skills. So we've you know, obvious examples like uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and, and 360. There's tools that give uh, you know, a bit of image quality, UHD and HDR and so on. Is, is storytelling through object-based media, is that just another one of these different tools that you have in your armory to be able to tell these stories? Because I, I sort of hear some of the same arguments with, for example, 360, that, oh, the audience will be able to pick their own uh, angle and uh, choose it. So there's some similarities there, but, uh, well, Ian, you're, you're shaking your head, so. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, so the, the thing about object-based media is that you can imagine, and this is some of the research that we need to do, that you could use, you could apply the same principle to, to VR, for example. I mean, really, real VR um, is made up of, of uh, algorithms and objects that are kind of positioned at certain places. So it's already kind of object-based. It's kind of from more the kind of games point of view. But you could apply the same principle in many different ways. Um, this isn't just a, another flash in the pan type stuff or higher quality. This is, this is actually fundamental. This is the way that we tell stories. We're using the technology to tell stories how we used to tell stories. And that's the big difference. You know, and we're able to to, yeah, we can do hyper-personalization, we can do stories which, which fit to a city or to a region, to a time. That's a fundamental difference between, you know, higher quality or, or HDR or something like that. So, so um, as, as the time in this session runs to an end, I've got a couple of questions that I, I would like to finish up with, and we may still have time for other questions coming in. Um, it, it sounds like you think this is something that's going to become mainstream. So is this something we expect to see across all genres, all kinds of content, or will it be something that <laughs> remains a little bit niche? I, I think, so ultimately, we, you know, this is the reason why we're here, right? Is that we are researching uh, that we think it, it can be, and we would love to have more storytellers, more writers, more directors try this. So if you are interested in this, come and join us. We have a community of practice. Uh, we're looking for people to, to experiment and work with us. Because, for example, we don't know if this could be more efficient to shoot stuff than, than doing it the old way. We don't know. And this is all stuff that we're trying to experiment and find out. We have two minutes left. Um, I've got one question that I'd, I'd love a 20 second answer to um, from somebody. Any estimates for the production costs? And are there then evidence that those incremental costs are borne out by better audience engagement and higher audience numbers? Anyone feel I've, daring? I've already spoken so much, so I feel like, I mean, I Julius, you've made content. You, I think in the previous session, you did say that there's probably around 20% extra effort going in. Yeah, I think 20% extra time, effort, um, thinking. But I think the end results are a lot more beneficial. So to wrap up, I, I wanted to just turn back to the title, which is about the audience. And, and really, we set off saying this is not just a tool to, to satisfy the whims of, of directors and writers and creatives. This is actually about understanding the fact that audiences have changed and the way they consume content has changed. So I'd just like to kind of get your, your very brief take, e each of you, on how you think this is meeting the needs of a modern audience and the difference it's going to make to people that are consuming your content. Um, I think that the main thing for me is that it allows people to interact with the story in a really personal way um, and to be able to own that story and get a deeper emotional connection to it. Um, I'm going to try and bottle it down. Okay, so there was a f the first talk talked about attention and, and if you look at the modern living room, um, we are, our attention's all over the place and I do think that um, being able to 
make things more relevant or or to surprise people is is really yeah will satisfy a modern audience much better than we currently do yeah, a, a more personalized experience as well as me telling my story you can personalize it yourself by changing the music changing the point of view changing the colors and so forth well, everything they've said, really. Um, but from a news point of view, if we can make the editorial and the technical challenges work, uh, it, it really does open up a world where you can find out what you don't know, um, rather than having to wade through a stuff that you already, you already know, um, or, or a format that you don't understand. That's the, that's the opportunity for us there with object-based media. Great. Well, I want to thank you for sharing with us how you see this uh, technique of, of telling stories in a new way evolving and the benefit of uh, for audiences. Uh, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm sure you'll also thank me in uh, thanking Sarah Glenister, Ian Forrester, Julius Amadami, and Rob McKenzie.